Hello everybody. In this video, I would like to talk about uh, judgmental forecasting in general. And uh, then I would like to talk about a uh, new product forecasting. So um, there is this survey from 1994. It's been a while, but uh, I think the results are still valid. Uh, so they asked managers uh, how often they use judgmental methods to forecast instead of statistical methods. And as you can see, um, most managers, 57% of them, always use judgmental forecasting. And then uh, there's this, uh, there are those who say frequently, 21% use judgmental methods frequently. And 10% um, uh, rarely use judgmental methods and 4% never use judgmental methods. So as you can see, judgmental forecasting is very, very uh, prevalent. So, so why is judgmental forecasting so popular? The most popular answer is, is it's more accurate. I mean, despite all the data availability and, and um, these uh, fancy statistical methods, sometimes, uh, or, or in many cases, judgmental methods can be more accurate, okay? So, um, the second most popular answer is it's difficult to find data for quantitative methods. And this is especially true if you are talking about a new product. And for new products, you won't have historical sales data, so you cannot use statistical methods. And then there is the ease of use. So uh, it's really easy to just come up with a number off the top of your head. Um, you know, judgmental methods are much more easier. Uh, they're less costly. So these are the main reasons why judgmental methods are uh, more popular. How about combining judgmental and statistical methods? So it's like um, we're trying to take the, uh, take the best of both worlds. Do companies combine judge their judgment with statistical methods? And in fact, the survey says so. So 45% of the respondents said they always adjusted their forecasts generated by statistical methods using their judgment. And 37% uh, said um, they frequently did so. So again, this is a very, very uh, popular practice. So even if you use statistical methods, um, you can then adjust your uh, forecasts using your managerial judgment. So why do managers uh, tweak statistical forecasts after they have been generated by a statistical algorithm? So um, there are some very... Uh, reason good reasons for this so to incorporate knowledge of the environment so there are changes in the environment but time series methods for example assume everything will continue like before so if you want to incorporate add that information to your forecast you can use your judgment to adjust the forecast a second uh, reason is to incorporate product knowledge. Maybe your product has changed a little bit. Maybe the the, uh, uh, the price may have changed or something like that. Incorporate uh, product knowledge. And then there's the uh, reason to incorporate past experience. So these are not very quantitative uh, pieces of data. So these are not very quantifiable information. So... Uh, statistical methods do not easily consider these, so it's difficult to represent these in a statistical forecasting algorithm. So people then uh, adjust statistical forecasts in order to incorporate uh, unquantifiable data. So when we use our judgment as managers, as forecasters, okay, um, 
we may introduce some error and bias. Why? Because human cognition has limits. Okay? So human judgment is not always perfect. Okay? So um, what, what are the limitations? First of all, our, um, our attention um, let's, let me see this. So our attention is limited. Okay, we cannot focus on everything all at once. So our attention is limited, our memory is limited, and our information process, information process, uh, process processing capability is limited. Okay, we can only pro, pro, uh, process so much information at a time. So, given these limitations, human judgment relies on heuristics. Okay, what is heuristics? So there are two uh, types of uh, methods for solving a problem, exact, inexact. And exact method will give you the exact optimal solution to a problem. Okay, so for example, um, if you use uh, an optimization model, for example, uh, Excel Solver uh, doesn't give you an exact solution, um, but uh, if you had a really good software, that would give you the exact optimal solution. However, uh, sometimes uh, getting the exact solution can take a long time. So for that, people have developed quick and dirty methods of solving a problem. And these are called heuristics, okay? A heuristic is an inexact method of solving a problem, okay? Uh, that, that will work really quickly. It will give you an answer. Uh, the answer will be good, but it's not going to be exactly optimal, okay? So given these limitations, human cognition Cognition means uh, judgment, decision making, uh, memory, uh, etc. So our mental uh, faculties. So uh, these are based. Our mental faculties are based not on exact problem solving methods, but our cognition relies on heuristics, shortcuts. Okay. Uh, in the real world, uh, we face many problems and we don't have a lot of time, we need to make a decision uh, in a split, split second. And then that's why we use, uh, we um, uh, rely on um, shortcuts, quick methods that will give you a good answer, but the, the answer that we get may not be always optimal, okay? Uh, in addition, human judgment can introduce biases. So some people are more optimistic than others, so they may have an optimism bias in their judgments, etc. So uh, last time we've talked about many, many different types of biases. And in fact, there are dozens and dozens of different biases. So this table is just a uh, small part of the biases that have been identified by psychologists. So if you go deep into the literature, you will find dozens and dozens of biases uh, in human reasoning. And then we've briefly talked about uh, Fox versus Hedgehog thinking. So what are uh, some of the basic advantages of um, uh, judgmental forecasting. So one advantage is uh, qualitative methods can uh, be used uh, more easily to predict changes in sales patterns. So time series typi typically assumes that the pattern will continue into, in the, into the future, and that may be partly correct, but there may also be some slight shifts in the patterns of sales and uh, qualitative forecasting, judgmental forecasting can easily incorporate those slight shifts into the forecasting model. Also, uh, qual oops, uh, let me 
go back. Uh, so qualitative methods uh, can also allow you to use richer sources of data. So you can go look at tweets, you can look, go look at social media posts, you can look at, you know, you, you can just talk to people on the street to get a better idea of consumer sentiment. And that uh, can allow you, qualitative methods can allow you to incorporate your intuition, your experience and your judgment into forecasts much more easily. So. Uh, of course, um, as with anything, judgmental forecasting also has some uh, disadvantages, okay? So one is uh, the recency bias, okay? So let's suppose you observe uh, demand for a product over time, over a long period of time, maybe for five years, six years, etc. So what people do is they typically discount information in the fa in the past and they overemphasized more recent information okay so they put more weight on the more recent information so that may lead you uh, that may lead to a biased judgment so um, and uh, today we have lots and lots and lots of information uh, we have almost too much information so if you have that much information, then, you know, you cannot use your judgment. I mean, human cognition is not capable, like human faculties, abilities are not, uh, are not enough to process that much information. And then, of course, uh, uh, people tend to be overconfident, even, even if people think they are neutral, they are unbiased. We typically tend to be uh, overconfident. And of course, sometimes some people are more pessimistic uh, too. So then uh, there is a lot of politics in an organization, okay? So no matter how neutral you want to be, no matter how neutral you want your forecast to be, you know, at the back of your mind, I mean, there's all these politics within an organization and that, uh, and that can, that can affect your judgment in forecasting. So another uh, fallacy of uh, human judgment is even when the data is completely random, we tend to see patterns in relationships, okay? We like to think that uh, everything happens for a reason. Uh, there's a rhyme and reason for everything. And so even when there's just simply randomness in data, we, we are um, likely to see patterns when there are none, okay? So um, that's another bias that humans have. And then there's the anchoring bias, okay? So anchoring bias means... Um, once you, um, let's say, once there's a forecast, the second forecast will be a, um, influenced by the first forecast, okay? Even if the forecasts are uh, independent of each other, uh, we humans tend to kind of rely a little bit on the previous forecast, okay? So, uh, there are a few others. Uh, the future ability to forecast actually maybe what they for. Okay, okay, all right. So let's suppose um, you use your judgment for forecasting, and um, you let's say make a mistake, which is very very normal. So when the next time comes uh, to forecast. So the next time you forecast, um, you try to kind of vindicate yourself. You maybe get a little bit defensive. So trying to justify that you were not that much off previously uh, can kind of like uh, divert your attention from trying to understand what went wrong and trying to fix it. 
okay so sometimes we tend to be overly um, defensive and try to we try to like justify ourselves okay so our moods and emotions affect our decision making we're emotional beings okay and um, some qualitative uh, forecasting methods can be time consuming okay so computers can do forecasts in a split second but for us humans it just takes a lot of time much much more time so there are some I just want to go over some uh, methods for qualitative forecasting one is a jury of executive opinion so uh, imagine a small group of high-level executives okay sitting in a room and um, let's suppose they don't they're talking about new products maybe they don't have a lot of historical data so uh, this is uh, appropriate when you don't have a lot of uh, historical data uh, you have high-level executives they have a lot of power in the organization so they discuss the uh, forecasts uh, they discuss market factors they discuss uh, you know com competing products etc and they can combine uh, their expertise from multiple fields to arrive at a forecast so you get different perspectives different inputs different insights from multiple departments and that's a good thing makes your forecast more realistic and this is typically done for longer term forecasts because you cannot expect the uh, vice presidents to worry about each SKU so they're talking about a more aggregate sales forecast and they're talking about more like uh, two three four years into the future and the advantage of this is that once they agree on a forecast you have consensus within an organization so different departments uh, do not uh, work on different assumptions on different forecasts so every everybody agrees on a uh, consensus forecast now uh, the uh, another advantage is uh, uh, you know teamwork okay uh, it can combine managerial experience with statistical models best of both worlds okay it can be relatively quick because you don't talk about individual SKUs you're talking about maybe product lines or maybe total sales or maybe um, regional sales uh, aggregates uh, however there are um, uh, potential drawbacks to this uh, method one is groupthink okay so groupthink means people are less likely to voice uh, uh, diverse opinions uh, because they they feel like they should conform to the group consensus okay so people discount their knowledge even if it's true even if it if that knowledge is valuable and useful people discount it because they want to comply and conform with the group okay and sometimes uh, there will be one or more dominant personalities and they can drive the discussion they can drive the uh, decision making and other people may not be willing to challenge them there could be political pressures um, and the thing is the responsibility for accuracy is diluted let's say a group of people uh, make a forecast and that forecast uh, turns out to be way off um, you know who like who's responsible and nobody takes responsibility and since nobody takes responsibility people are not incentivized to spend a lot of time and effort to come up with a good forecast okay and of course uh, executive opinion cannot be uh, applied at the SKU level you need to talk about aggregate product products uh, maybe product lines etc so there's a Delphi method uh, Delphi method um, 
is basically uh, uh, applied in a few steps. First, you uh, collect a, a panel of experts. Okay, so these experts can be industry experts, uh, or they can be experts from your own company. So you can identify a group of experts, four, five, six, etc., and then you ask them each individually. Okay, what is your judgmental forecast? What is your opinion? And every expert says, okay, this is my forecast. This is my opinion, independent of others. Okay. And then you collect all the res responses, you summarize the responses, and return the responses to the experts. So the experts, each expert knows what their forecast was and what other people have said, what other experts have said. So then they're given a chance to revise their judgmental forecast. And some will and some won't um, to varying degrees. Okay. And then you do a second round of this, okay? And over multiple rounds, maybe two, three, four rounds, the um, forecasts converge, okay? They get closer and closer, and that's your uh, uh, judgmental forecast from the Delphi method, okay? Uh, one disadvantage is uh, this can be very time-consuming because you go round by round. So it's best to use this uh, for uh, strategic term, uh, longer term strategic forecasts. Then there's the uh, Salesforce composite. So typically companies have uh, different territories. They, uh, 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 they divide... Uh, the 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 um, uh, the geography into different sales territories, and they assign to each sales territory a single salesperson. Okay, um, they have different districts, etc. And sales representatives interact with the customers directly, one on one, so they know exactly what customers need and want, or may be willing to pay for. So, uh, because they know so much about the customers, uh, companies collect uh, sales forecasts from each uh, sales representative, okay? And then they, collect, they add up all these sales forecasts uh, to uh, come up with a uh, with a uh, sales for total sales forecast uh, for the total sales. However, uh, Salesforce composites can be optimistic or pessimistic. Okay, so uh, salespeople are typically uh, paid a commission. Okay, so they uh, they get paid a commission if they exceed a certain sales quota. Okay, so they want to keep the sales quota as low as possible so that they can easily exceed it. So their forecasts tend to be typically pessimistic. Okay, so this much about uh, judgmental forecasting. Now let's switch gears to new product forecasting. Okay, first of all, uh, companies love, love, love new products. They're always uh, after introducing a, the next uh, biggest and best thing. And the reason for this, there's a very good reason for this, because new products are more profitable than existing products. Okay? So when a, first, when a product is first launched, its price uh, tend to be higher than existing products, and therefore new products generate more profits for the companies. And over time, the uh, products of exist, uh, the prices of existing products tend to go down, and uh, the profits also level off and maybe uh, decrease a little bit. So companies would like to introduce new products uh, periodically, 
okay, every year, every uh, maybe six months, etc. And a typical example of this is iPhone. iPhone 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, etc. Okay, so um, uh, every year there's a new iPhone and it's at the highest price point and then the previous iPhone's prices decrease, etc., etc. So when a new product is um, launched, uh, you need a forecast. Why do you need a forecast? Because you need to plan uh, production. Okay, how much to produce, when. Okay, when to produce and how much to produce. You need to plan for distribution. Where to ship, how much to ship, when to ship. Okay, that's your distribution plan. And that, that depends on the forecast for the new product. Inventory management. Whoops. So, um, for this new product, okay, for this new product, um, how much inventory should you hold uh, at your distribution center? How much should you, how much inventory should you hold at the retail store and at various tiers in the supply chain? And also, how much uh, marketing and promotional activities uh, should you uh, engage in? Okay, for this new product, when, how much to spend, etc. So, if you do not have a good forecast for the new product, the new product is likely to fail because without a, a good forecast, you will mess up production, you will mess up distribution, you will mess up inventory management, you will mess up marketing and promotional activities. So, a precondition for a successful new product is a good forecast for the new product. So I'm going to skip the next few uh, the, the next few slides. Okay. Um, so at this point, I'd like to go over the uh, article by Patrick Bauer entitled uh, Forecasting New Products in uh, Consumer Goods. So um, and the first thing is, why is it difficult to forecast uh, new products? First of all, uh, the uh, there is no good uh, forecasting methods for um, uh, new products uh, because uh, data is not available. Uh, also, uh, this for this new product, there are a lot a lot of things that are going on, uh, trends, pop culture, the economic situation, even the price of gas. Okay, so there are a lot of moving parts, and you don't have historical sales data, so that makes it difficult for you to generate a forecast for a new product. The second interesting point is most new products fail within a short period of time. So uh, Product Development and Management Association says that 49% uh, uh, of uh, new products uh, fail uh, within a short period of time. So um, a lot of products are not well uh, accepted by the consumers. Also, uh, new products carry a lot of emotional uh, aspirations with it. So, uh, when companies introduce new products, there are product managers, there are product designers, they're excited about their new ideas, new products, new markets, etc. So, they typically uh, ha end up having a bias uh, towards overestimating the prospects for their uh, new product. So, what is a uh, typical forecast error for a new product. So new products tend to have a high MAPE and 80% is uh, a typical um, uh, error for new products. So uh, and in general forecast error tends to be uh, twice uh, 
of well-established products twice as uh, as inaccurate for new products and um, especially the for, for the first six months the uh, new product uh, uh, forecast will be really really difficult to make so um, and gradually as time goes on the forecast the sales will stabilize the forecast will stabilize and you will have an easier time to generate a forecast so what are some reasons for uh, a f high forecast error for the new product first of all uh, you may think that you have a good idea. The company may think that it has a good idea, new product, uh, new and improved. But sometimes customers don't buy that idea. My, sometimes customers may think, okay, it's just a mediocre extension of existing products. So the consumers may not uh, receive the new product idea uh, that well. The second thing we already said, uh, market research can be overly optimistic and aspirational. And then during the launch, a lot of things can go wrong, right? So messaging can go wrong, advertising, promotion, maybe uh, less than perfect, the positioning of the product on the shelf inventory levels, etc. Since the product is new, there could still be quality problems with the product. You know, pro production processes may not be well tuned because the product is new and there could be still some design, lingering design problems with the new product. And especially in times of economic hardship, customers may be hesitant to try new products. When, when times are good, people are making good money, then people will be maybe more likely to try new products. But when money is tight, then, you know, they may think twice before uh, trying a new product. Also, retailers have limited shelf space. They cannot easily add new products to their assortment, that their product mix, okay? So... They, they, they have to be picky because they have, they can carry only so many products. And then if they just carelessly add random new products to their product mix, to their assortment, then that's not going to be good for the retailer. So you need to make a good, as a manufacturer, you need to make a good case, uh, a convincing case for the retailers for them to, uh, add your pro new product to their assortment. So, uh, what are some common characteristics of companies who uh, do better uh, in terms of forecasting new products? First of all, uh, they love data and they try to find the highest quality of information. And by highest quality, I mean uh, more facts, okay? More facts than just uh, random guesses, okay? The more data you collect and the more factual your data is, the better of a starting point that you have. The second uh, common characteristic is uh, they uh, consider multiple scenarios, Okay, so this author calls them bands. So you have your baseline plan, baseline forecast, mo most likely scenario. You have the maximum upside and downside, the best case, the worst case scenarios. So you need to consider all these different scenarios and you need to have a plan for each scenario. So it says uh, they build plans from the bottom up, not necessarily from the bottom up, okay, but they start with the appropriate level of planning, okay. Are you looking at uh, at the customer level or the channel level or the retail store level? You need to think about how the product is going to be introduced, and decide at which level of aggregation 
you need to plan your uh, your product introduction. Uh, and then you need to uh, be aware of your assumptions. Okay, so you have a plan. Uh, under what conditions is your plan realistic? Okay, or under what conditions will your plan be unrealistic? Okay, what are your assumptions? Uh, be open to challenge your assumptions. Okay, whether they're realistic or not. Be open to digest. Uh, be a, uh, be open to uh, explore the implications of your assumptions. If you assume a certain thing, what does that really mean for your plan? Okay, what are the uh, implications of your assumptions? And if need be, be willing to change your assumptions. Okay. So, and lastly, demand planning has a voice in creating the product launch plan. Because typically, if you leave the product launch to marketing and sales, they will do a good job on the consumer end, but they're going to fail uh, on the back end, on the production, distribution, inventory management. Okay, These things are much better uh, uh, planned by demand planning. So you need to combine front end and back end planning. Okay. So the author lays out a three-step plan for uh, generating uh, uh, forecasts for new products. The first is to gather inputs from marketing and sales. Okay, uh, I used to think marketing and sales are the same thing. Well, in, in the real world, they're very, very different. Marketing and sales are very, very different in the real world. And when you approach them, they will give you very, very uh, different uh, types of information. Okay, so let's start with marketing. When you talk to marketing, they will give you an overly optimistic forecast for the consumer reaction. Okay, so why are they optimistic? Because first of all, they're invested in their ideas. Okay, they have spent a lot of time and effort in developing a concept, in designing a product. There's a lot of um, you know uh, work that has gone into that product, and they want to succeed that product as much as possible. So they're invested in it, and they're naturally very optimistic. And because of their optimism, they assume full distribution. Okay, so what that means is that they assume every retailer will sell their product at every retail store. Okay, well, in real life, that may not be the case. Okay, second, they assume the most favorable customer response. Again, they're thinking very optimistically. And then uh, they assume that their advertising, their promotion, their communications will be 100% effective. Hopefully it is, but realistically, this may not be the case. Uh, they also uh, typically disregard cannibalization. In other words, um, they disregard how many customers will switch from existing products to new products. Yes, when you introduce a new product, the sales may soar for the new product, but that may come at the expense of existing products. Okay, so the net effect of introducing a new product may not always be an increase in total sales. Sales simply may shift from an existing product to a new product. So you need to understand how much cannibalization there could be when you introduce a new product. And again, the marketing department completely ignores uh, the back end. In other words, uh, 
They ignore how much inventory needs to be positioned at the production plant, at the distribution center, at the retail store, etc. So they, they're they not uh, very knowledgeable about these uh, the, the amount of inventory that needs to be in the uh, supply chain. So they're more focused on the consumer response. So what do you do to uh, kind of neutralize the opt uh, optimism of the marketing department? Okay, so the first thing you can do is you can ask them for a banded forecast. Okay, what is a banded forecast? Here's a banded forecast. Okay, so this midline here is the most likely scenario. Okay, and then uh, this is the best case scenario. This is the worst case scenario. Okay, so you have three different scenarios. And for each scenario, you need to have a plan. You need to have a production plan. You need to have a distribution plan. You need to have a have an inventory plan. And also, it's interesting to see how the sales go from near zero, just jump, uh, like there's this huge spike. Okay, so that's, that's, that's a huge change. Okay, so you need to, can you ramp up production this quickly? Probably not, right? So you cannot just uh, uh, increase production, let's say, tenfolds or whatever. So you need to build up inventory. You need to build up inventory in the pipeline, at the retail stores, etc. case and worst case scenarios they can help you understand your assumptions and they can kind of help you in your uh, planning. So another thing um, you should ask um, marketing is about distribution. Okay. So distribution is basically how many retailers sell your product at how many of their locations. Okay, so typically uh, mark, uh, marketing assumes that all of your retail customers will sell your product at all of their retail stores. Okay, however, this may not be true because retailers don't have limitless a limitless amount of shelf space, so they need to be picky about uh, which products that uh, which products they carry. So. Uh, you can safely assume that some of your retail customers will not purchase your product. And even those retail customers that purchase your product will not sell them at all of their locations. Okay. You need to have a realistic idea how much distribution a particular new product will get. And uh, it's rarely 100%. Now, add to distribution the velocity. Okay. The velocity is basically distribution is at how many retail stores is your product selling and velocity is how fast is your product selling at each retail location. Maybe one per week in a retail location, two, three, four. Uh, so the idea is uh, this is the demand rate times the number of uh, retail stores where your product is sold is is your baseline forecast however how do you estimate velocity how do you estimate how how much or how fast your product is going to sell it's it's completely uh, judgmental uh, you can look at similar products you can look look at previous products uh, you can have a guesstimate, but it's very difficult to to uh, determine with any any degree of accuracy. Okay, so then uh, there is cannib cannib uh, cannibalization and incrementality. Okay, so if you uh, introduce a new product to the market and your 
existing customers switch from a product but from one one of your products to your new product then you don't get much incremental increase in total sales so your customers will switch uh, from product a to product b okay so again you're not going to get uh, a lot of incremental revenue uh, in terms of total sales so how much will so when when you introduce of when you introduce a new product how many new customers will you gain and how many existing customers will switch okay that switch is the cannibalization and it's very very difficult to to predict so you can look at your existing uh, products you can compare your existing products to your new product okay you know will customers switch uh, why would they switch will which or which type of customers will be able to switch or are likely to switch will price be a factor will convenience be a factor so they're all uh, different kinds of different considerations to take into account so cannibalization and and incrementality have to be taken into account and as a demand planner you would like to know what marketing thinks in terms of how much cannibalization and incrementality there will be and then of course there is uh, media and and promotion plans how much advertising will be on tv how much will advertising will be on radio coupons newspapers in-store displays all of these things will give a boost to to demand and you need to know how much promotion will be made at what points in time so you need to plan for those uh, bumps in demand uh, coming from uh, particular promotional activities how much promotion will be made at what points in time and where and you need to take into account those demand uh, bumps when you make your uh, demand plan so now let's talk about uh, gathering input from sales so what's the difference between marketing and sales so marketing people uh, typically think of the end consumer individuals and how they will react to the new product but sales is in the actual business of uh, contacting retailers signing agreements and actually shipping the products to the retailers so kind of like uh, the, the salespeople are more uh, 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 in tune with the actual uh, retail industry if the retailers might be interested in the products so typically uh, salespeople go and uh, present the actual product to retailers okay this could be a trade show this this could be something else and they get a, an impression of how retailers perceive a new product now the retailers may not uh, typically say yes I'm going to buy this or no they kind of uh, give a um, an, uh, a non-committal un, un, uh, less uh, they give a less than a commitment uh, to to a product they say oh it looks nice or whatever so uh, because the reason is uh, the retailers uh, the retail representatives do not make a decision on the spot so uh, the retail uh, representatives can also provide important feedback to the uh, 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 to the uh, sales representative because they may have con uh, objections or concerns about you know packaging pricing uh, upcoming products from other competitors etc so uh, once the uh, uh, retailers know about the new product uh, of course they will there will be some uh, new products coming uh, at the same time there there will be multiple uh, manufacturers introducing new products so uh, what they do is uh, 
the retailers will go back and evaluate their alternatives. Why? Because uh, their shelf space is limited and their inventory dollars are limited. So they have a limited amount of shelf space and dollars to carry these uh, new items, new products in their stores. So they're very cautious and um, they need to uh, go through several steps of review before they add a new product to their portfolio. So typically new products are get a uh, new a, an assortment gets or or a category a category will be reviewed once a year that means uh once a uh the composition of a category is established once the retailer decides to sell a certain uh, uh set of products in a given category they'll keep this decision for a year and then they'll readjust after a year so uh typically uh retailers will uh, only approve a limited number of SKUs and a lot of the retailers what they do is when they add a new product to their category they remove a an existing product from the category okay so they cannot just keep adding uh, new products to their category indefinitely. So they want to uh, maintain uh, a small number of items in a category. So as a result, even if a retailer uh, uh, accepts to sell a product in their retail stores, they may not sell uh, this new product at all their, in all their retail stores. They may sell this new product at some of their retail stores. So it's uh, the 100% distribution is an unrealistic assumption. Given that uh, sales typically uh, contacts the customers, the, the retailers in person, discusses uh, retailers' concerns or objections about new products in person, they tend to have a more pessimistic view of the new product. So once the retailers, uh, once the salespeople talk to retailers, they often provide you feedback about uh, how, to lower, how to lower the marketing forecast because the retailers can tell you, okay, which retailers are unlikely to carry your product um, um, and then which uh, retail store, how many retail stores will carry or not carry uh, the retail products. And uh, salespeople can also lower the velocity expectations that you get from marketing. So typically when you get input from sales, uh, you can lower uh, your uh, you, the forecasts that you get from marketing. So once a new product is approved by a retailer, in other words, once a um, retailer si signs an agreement with the manufacturer that they will carry this new product in their stores and, and will sell them in their new stores, uh, you need to update uh, your forecast because now you have a new customer, you need to think about how you will distribute the product in what in which uh, stores, how much each store uh, will sell, and then the uh, pie fill inventory, okay? So these are the three important um, questions you need to answer. And the plans need to be finalized typically three months before the uh, sh first ship date. Okay, three months before you uh, begin shipping your first product, you need to prepare your manufacturing and inventory. And then uh, that needs to, uh, for you to do that, you need to finalize your plans, distribution, cons consumption, and pipe fill plans three months before the first ship date. Okay, so the sales will give you information 
on the uh, pipe fill inventory. Okay, what is pipe fill? So uh, you have this new product and the retailer has no inventory on the shelf. Okay, so first you need to ship a certain amount of inventory, certain amount of product to each retail store so that uh, you fill the shelf space allocated for that new product. Okay, so that's the initial shipment of product that fills the shelves of the retail stores. Okay, so that's the uh, pipe fill inventory. Now, the uh, how much uh, pipe fill inventory do you need? Okay, it depends on the uh, estimates, demand estimates, and store counts. Okay, how many stores will carry uh, inventory and how much inventory does each store need to fill the shelf? And then uh, you need to think about a regular... Uh, replenishment of uh, your shelf inventory so as customers buy uh, your product uh, at the retail stores you will have to send replenishment inventory to the retail stores to restock the shelves that's regular consumption plus there will be promotional activities coupons and cap displays etc during the uh, promotional activities you will see additional demand and you need to ship more products during those times to cover this sales lift okay so uh, the uh, demand for the new product uh, will take some time to stabilize okay so demand for the new product will not be at the uh, long-term average. It could be uh, fluctuating at first as customers become more aware of the product, as customers uh, try the new product, etc. After some point, the uh, product demand uh, for the new product will uh, reach an equilibrium level. But to reach that equilibrium level, there needs to be some time, okay? So the sales department will take into account the uh, pipe fill, promotional uh, lift, and the full consumption, and they will prepare a plan or a forecast by taking these into account. Okay, so um, they look at uh, demand in terms of how much each retailer demands. Okay. So they aggregate demand in terms of uh, uh, by retailers. However, that is not enough information for demand plan. What do I mean by that? Uh, take a look at this. So uh, this is uh, expected sales for a uh, new product uh, for a given uh, supply uh, for a given retailer. And so they have these dates, shipping dates, uh, pipe uh, quantity, uh, pipe fill demand, okay, uh, in terms of units, in terms of dollars, annualized units, etc. So they give you this information, but this is at the very aggregate level. So you need a more, uh, as a demand planner, you need more detailed information. For example, Here's an example of a monthly uh, schedule of uh, demand. Okay, how much uh, needs to go to Kroger, Safeway, uh, American, CNS, uh, Publix, Meyer, etc. So for each account, you have a different uh, amount and you have multiple months. Okay. So you need a schedule like this, okay? How much do I need to ship to which customer in which month, okay? So if you have this type of information, you're uh, more uh, readily, uh, you, you can more readily plan uh, your 
production and inventory management activities okay so um, here's another example so you can start with an initial pipe fill okay and that's going to be like a first order once the store shelves are filled then you'll have regular demand okay so this is um, a regular um, demand uh, rate okay so it goes on forever like this and then uh, when you offer a promote price promotion okay so that's going to reduce your uh, uh, revenues because you're discounting okay so uh, discount for discovery and then you advertise you increase customer awareness so that's going to increase okay uh, so there's a pipe lead here okay and then uh, forecast with no seasonality and seasonal shifts and the total forecast is here this is the total forecast is the sum of all these components okay so uh, let's talk about the uh, demand plan okay given the uh, inputs from marketing and sales okay how can you construct a uh, realistic demand plan okay so so the second step after uh, getting input from marketing and sales is to assemble a um, realistic demand plan a demand plan is a starting point for all supply chain activities okay so what happens in a supply chain when it happens in a supply chain where uh, and how much are all determined by demand because all the supply chain activities are geared towards satisfying demand and knowing uh, what demand will how much demand there will be when and where will determine the supply chain activities so it's critical to have a good uh, demand plan uh, for successfully managing your supply chain activities so far we have gotten input from marketing and sales and we have challenged the uh, numbers that we get from marketing and sales not not in a in an adversarial role but in in trying to understand more deeply where the numbers are coming from okay so as such when we combine these numbers that we get from marketing and sales uh, with the constraints of the organization we get a more realistic uh, estimate for uh, orders and shipments so the thing is consumers will buy your products at a retail store one by one however your company will receive batch orders from the retailer so you need to think about how the uh, uh, retailer will uh, consolidate orders and when uh, the orders will be placed with your company is is critical and how much you will ship is critical so when you arrive at the final estimates you need to get uh, the um, buy-in from sales and marketing because you can explain to them your assumptions your reasoning your reason uh, your your uh, justifications uh, you can talk to them about distribution assumptions your growth ramp etc uh, and when you put together a realistic demand plan that kind of brings everything together so this is typically done in uh, sales and operations planning and this is where you get the um, consensus forecast the demand plan that everybody in an organization uh, agrees on okay so this will be your uh, demand plan now of course despite your best efforts when you start implementing your plan 
immediately you will feel that your plan is off okay and that's that's very normal that's natural okay so uh, uh, the world is constantly changing so it's important to build in flexibility in your plan okay so you should have an idea about what could change anticipate potential changes and you should have plans for different scenarios okay all stakeholders should review forecasts so once you make the uh, demand plan uh, of course in sales and operations planning you discuss this with marketing sales production logistics etc okay so everybody will agree on this but uh, you should also discuss what will happen if something changes okay uh, in both directions if demand goes up what will each department do if demand goes down what will each department do the idea is for every department to be ready with a plan uh, when demand changes unexpectedly okay so one thing uh, to track very carefully is cannibalization and incrementality rates so uh, during the first days and weeks of a new product product launch you need to carefully track how fast your product is selling how much cannibalization it leads to and how much the total sales increase okay so that will give you uh, uh, the, the first uh, few weeks and months are the most uncertain because demand has not reached equilibrium point yet okay so the market is still to getting to know your product the consumers the competitors etc there's a lot of things up in the air so you need to track very carefully what's going on in the market okay and then once you reach equilibrium once your demand stabilizes then uh, you can relax and then you can uh, uh, step a little bit further back from the product because now the the demand has stabilized but before that happens you need to be very careful what's uh, about what's happening in the marketplace and react accordingly and finally and this is extremely important every new product launch is a practice round for the next product launch in other words every time you launch a new product you need to learn something that you can do better for the next time you uh, launch a new product okay so when you manage uh, an organization that launches new products so it's not like you should not think of new products as independent activities okay so you will be regularly introducing new products and you will go through the sim the same steps or similar steps and the idea is let's let's lo learn from our mistakes so that we don't repeat them uh, and then so our uh, pro new products are more successful in the future